Welcome to Mobile Agent TV. Uh, I am Michael Thorne of Remax Little Oak Realty in Langley, BC. And my phenomenal co-host, Dave Falkware, is not with us. He's back in New Jersey. Um, and if, for those who don't know, or the first time they've, uh, they've seen this, uh, this show, is this is episode 94. We, we do a show, an online show, every Friday. We try to do every Friday. And we bring on really smart people uh, that will affect our industry, and we sort of pick their brains. Uh, and so Dave is back in New Jersey. I'm really excited that you go to uh, New Jersey uh, on Tuesday and do a live show with with, with uh, Dave of New Jersey. And then I am off to Berlin, and we'll do a live mobile agent TV from Berlin too as well. So it's been uh, it's been a whole lot of fun. So uh, that being said, I do want to give a shout out to my co-host Dave uh, because the the, the the Toronto Blue Jays won yesterday. All right. <laughs> And on record, uh, during spring training, uh, at the beginning of every episode, I asked Dave a question. And uh, during spring training, I said, Dave, who plays in the World Series? And this is on YouTube. You can go find it right now. During spring training, Dave said the World Series will be contested between the New York Mets and the Toronto Blue Jays. And uh, it's game five for, uh, for the Mets tonight. So go Mets. Uh, sitting in Dave's co-host chair is Valerie Garcia. Uh, so we had uh, Marinder and Elton up re representing the West Coast and East Coast. Uh, uh, West Coast and East Coast. So I thought it'd be great to have uh, Valerie uh, come and sit in the co-host chair. Um, we won't be monitoring a Twitter like we normally are, but you might want to interact with each other. People watching live by using the hashtag MATV Live as well as hashtag Remax. Actually. Now, our first guest has a play to catch, so I want to dig into it because we just had lunch together, and I think there's some great content we can go, uh, go through. Uh, Jeremy Gucci is our guest from TrentHunter.com. Thank you, uh, Jeremy. Thanks for inviting me. Now, phenomenal talk today. Phenomenal talk. And we were having lunch again. I thought, well, maybe we could take some of the things you discussed about today in your keynote and maybe break it down a little bit more of a, of a hyper-local level. Um, you use the example of the blockbuster videos and, and, and BlackBerry and, and all that sort of stuff as companies that were ahead of the competition but behind the consumer and now find themselves irrelevant or out of business. And um, Steve Murray of Real Trends put out a phenomenal book last year and actually was mentioned today on stage uh, called Game Changers and it really breaks down what's happening within the real estate industry. And I was talking with Steve, I said, how many agents find themselves um, uh, behind the consumer? In, uh, in 2015, and what else could it be? Steve said that two thirds of agents find themselves behind the consumer. And so, what happens then, Jeremy, in the big picture wise? If one third of the agents out here are ahead of the consumer, but two thirds are behind the consumer, what does that one third do to that two thirds that aren't moving forward at, at a speed? Sure, and yeah, what I study is chaos and the impact of change. And my favorite stat actually started off today, although it gets a little outside real estate, is that. In the 1950s, the average lifespan of a Fortune 500 was 75 years, and that average has fallen down to just 15 years, and it's expected to fall in half. The reason why is that smart people, successful teams, start to repeat and optimize to protect whatever happened in the past, and they're getting disrupted in a faster moving world. And the metaphor I like to use is that after 10,000 years of evolution as farmers, once you find your field of opportunity, whatever puts food on the table, you're pretty required to repeat and optimize whatever led to last year's numbers. Now, we got into that in the talk today, but drawing that to real estate a little bit more, you have an industry where people start off as entrepreneurs, they're hungry, they're out of school, they start to build their business, they get their signs up in their neighborhood, they become successful, and once they do, there is a danger that they start to coast a little bit, suffering from those traps of the farmer. And if I was to explain how you see this, you look around and it's not tough to find realtors in your area uh, where people don't have websites, they're not using video. If you're obsessed about the next customer, if you're trying to get a millennial interested, you need to be in all of those areas. If I'm a young person wanting to sell my house, I'm going to pick the realtor that will put a video up. And I was laughing just this week, I saw a house on my neighborhood and it said, coming soon. So I'm all excited to see, oh, I got here inside my neighbor's house, great. Coming soon, I'm gonna real, I look up the realtor. I look him up, okay, he doesn't have a website. Oh, great, all I find is the complaint about him on something like a Yelp. That's now what I know about that realtor, and I didn't get a look inside the house yet, so I don't even understand the purpose of the sign. And I think a lot of realtors, this guy will use as our little example, 
um, get caught in the way that things used to be, where as we talked over lunch, the value of the realtor was the person who had the information of the listings and all of that. But now the consumer is coming in fully loaded from MLS or whatever, scouting out everything in advance. The value of the realtor you provide has to be different. And if I'm listing, that means I expect someone who's plugged in. I will pick my agent based on the one that will do a video or whatever. Not to totally drag out on video, but also, if you're my listing agent and you make a video, then why would I possibly switch to a different agent two months in if you don't sell? Because then I'll lose this wicked video that you made in my house. Um, and that's just a little bit of an example. But you said, I won't pick the agent that's plugged in. I, I think all the consumers out there have a measuring stick, and they're determining whether you're plugged in or not without sitting down and asking if you're plugged in. They're making yes. a determination without asking you if you're plugged in. And at uh, lunch, I gave a bit of an example where um, one of my other industries I do a lot of work in is finance and in wealth management. I remember that there was a banker on uh, high net worth management saying, yeah, but why do I need to be on Twitter? Give me one reason and I'll, I'll join. And I said, well, it's not about anyone reading your tweets. It's, that's irrelevant. But pretend that I'm a dude looking to pick a high net wealth manager and I'm talking to Sherry over there and Jesse over there. Jesse doesn't have a Twitter following. Who cares? He's successful. He's been doing this game for a long time. I have no idea how to measure if he's successful. But Sherry over there has 10,000 Twitter followers. And I talked to her and she goes, yeah, no, I'm like, a, you know, I'm a leader in the industry. I have 10,000 followers. All right. From the outside, I have no way to benchmark your performance. The measuring stick is that Twitter count. Now she gets my business and I have no other way to know if she's good or not. With realtors, there is this thing where I can't compare realtors because you're you're all number one of something. Oh, I'm number one, number eight, and I'm a gold club, triple president membership, number one, five years running, most successful agent in North America. How are they all the most successful agent in North America? But anyway, uh, if you have that doubt on site, that video, that experience, or something, uh, it's pretty exciting, and that's why we choose Sherry. The other little point I think that was cool, I just like gave an example of Staples, which is one of the clients of Trent Hunter uh, that we advise. And what the, you might not realize this, but Staples is the number three e-commerce site in the world because people buy everything for their office there. That's so important that one of the things they actually offer as a service is you go there, they will send to your office uh, an architect, interior designer, to help you spec everything out, figure out all the stuff you need. Oh, do you need Ethernet cables run all these desks? Sure, we got something for that. It alleviates all of the headaches. I, as a business owner, get to have an architect or designer but guess what? Now I'm using your services for everything. So I think as you think about real estate and what the services are, what the packages you are, if you recognize that somebody could just go to a propertyguys.com, skip the agency, find the MLS stuff themselves, then the person who's adding more value is the one that I choose. So when you talk about moving from a farming mentality to a hunting mentality, so you're talking about moving outside of what you always do, your habitual, this leads me to food, you know, this is how I eat my dinner every day because I grew this corn, blah, blah, blah. How do you move outside of that when you still have to eat every day into more of a hunting mentality? So in this industry, a lot of times, right, we focus on that deal that's right in front of us. How do we move from focusing on that deal to moving to focusing on three deals out and innovating to get to that point? Yeah, today I didn't talk about it as much as I would love to, but the idea that innovation is like portfolio management, I think is really important. And one of the things I had said earlier was that I don't need you to change 100%. You don't need to 100% become an innovator, but you need 10% of your time and your effort to become that adapter. And if you thought of that part of your career, like portfolio management, that 10% of your time that you're adapting, you don't need to do it. You keep on harvesting. But if you thought of it like your portfolio, you know you still need that high net worth stuff. I couldn't come to you in your portfolio and say, hey, let's take away, let's remove Google, Microsoft, Apple, and just put a donkey there and the rest of the stuff will be good. You'd say, no, I, ask, I need that stuff. I know it's riskier, but I know I can't retire without doing that. And I think in your own jobs, in your own business, you have to build in that some portion of your time and week has to be doing the adapting, because that's the part that doesn't happen automatically. And you need to think about that younger self that you had that was hungry and how you built your practice and recognize that there's 100 new agents that are eyeing you down right now, trying to use social, e-commerce, knocking on doors, or whatever to get up in your, your kitchen and to take business away from you. I think that that's a great point because a lot of time we say, hey, you have to innovate, you have to try video, you have to try social media. And people say, I don't I don't have the time for that. Who has the time to go and do all of that? Well, the thing is, 
one of the things that you're doing right now with that, not stopping doing everything. So not getting rid of all of the belly to belly and stopping your prospecting or your farming. Instead, you're just replacing one thing with innovation. It's a great point. So uh, I'm fortunate enough to work on a team with two other amazing agents, which affords, affords me the ability to try something new, implement, have, give, a, give a percentage of my business uh, to play time to, to find the next trend to constantly stay on, on the cutting edge. That's sort of what we try to build our brand around. Advice to most of these people in the room that are solopreneurs. It's just them. They don't have an innovation department. That's them. And so what advice can you give to someone saying, look, I don't have time to figure out which one of these eight new trends is actually going to have a huge impact on my business. I can afford to figure out which one of these two. How, how, how do we stay at the forefront and wait until we see enough to know that we aren't wasting a ton of time? Because we did talk about a lot of businesses Businesses that, that, that innovate the next thing, they can be they can be wrong a lot of the time because when they do come across a Snapchat or an Instagram, it's a home run and it makes up for those losses, much like a scientific method would be. Advice to sort of hedging our bet on what the next trend will be. I mean, part of it comes down to just being simple and thinking, what proportion of your week are you actively spending trying that new idea? And recognizing that that's the investment that you're putting back in yourself. And if you thought of your own finances, what proportion are you saving versus spending? And it's applying that same sort of mentality to, to your own career and trying something new. And I think there's also a lot of other realtors in the room, talk to some of the younger ones, figure out what they're doing. And video is the easy example that we're kind of nagging on, but how many big things, if I asked you, what are the five things that you think are the most important that I should be doing? You could give that office a list, video this, that, whatever. And if you're not doing, three of those five, then, you know, you're fading. And I think that's, you can get those answers by talking to some of the other realtors and, and seeing what they're up to. I, and, and I agree, and I want to plug the amazing uh, uh, Remax family, because I was uh, somewhere else with our team for 18 years before I joined Remax four some years ago. And now we're three years into this show, and all these conferences, I see other people doing really smart stuff, and I'll sit down and spend 20 minutes with them. Every person I've ever asked in this company has openly shared what they're doing. And I think if we just lift our head up, look around, you know, really go out and ask questions of our competitors, they are so willing to share. And, and I think that's a huge opportunity when you say three, the, the, if all the great agents say the same three or five things, that might be an indication that's something you, you need to be doing. Yeah, you have a very unique alliance in the room, which is that these are not the people that are directly in your market. You're very rare in that, that in almost any other industry, I'm still competing against you because we're online and all that wonderful stuff. But because you're local, you should really be leveraging this to, to its fullest. And, you know, technically that's even a, a challenge to push some of the Remax higher up, says, and like, hey, where is our inside team? Where's the package that we have that's doing X, Y, Z? And, uh, you know, there may be some directions that you, you know, you gotta apply a little pressure. And, you know, we know how these businesses have a lot of choice that they have to make. Uh, that's one opportunity. But the other part is you. Finding someone in the room that you think is a leader, asking them the questions, and seeing if they can hold you accountable. Uh, trade an email once a month and see where you're at. I think I think a lot of what you talked about today in your keynote has to do with a mindset and, and embracing that mindset. The example I use is at one time hotels advertised electricity as a value proposition. They had electricity and the hotel down the street didn't. And now we're seeing it right now with Wi-Fi. You know, we offer free Wi-Fi. You stay in a whole lot of hotels, it's an expected level of service, free Wi-Fi now. But there was a hotel in the last year or so who was the very last hotel who went kicking and screaming to give away free Wi-Fi because it became a, uh, a expected level of service. That hotel now gives away free Wi-Fi but never benefited from giving away the free Wi-Fi. And so we see companies in our industry like the Matterport which you talked about yesterday and it's an amazing 3D technology that comes with a $5,000 camera. And I talk to agents that say, well, I'll get it when it's a $1,000 camera, but what will cause the camera to go from $5,000 to $1,000 is, is, is mass acceptance of it. And then you don't have a unique value proposition anymore. How do we adopt the mindset is we are all going to be paperless five years from now. If I'm paperless today, at least I might benefit from being different for a short period of time. Yeah, I think there's a certain brand benefit where if you're the one that's trying the leading edge thing, let's say virtual reality, the trend under our whole site works in virtual reality, you can get a bubble can, it's called BUVL, it's like a GoPro, it costs 250 bucks, and you can shoot in virtual reality. People can now take their phones, slide them in a $10 Google Cardboard, 
and you could look at something in VR. If I was an agent today, I'd get a bubble cam for 400 bucks, I would shoot a house in VR, and then I'd give a person the $20 headset and say, check out my listings in virtual reality. And then a person can actually try the thing on and try it. That sounds like intense to you right now. But it's actually something you could execute for less than $1,000 and a little research. If you did it, you would absolutely be the only person right now in your neighborhood doing it. It doesn't matter if it gets you a new customer, it would change your brand. Like, wow, Melanie uses virtual reality. Yes, I want her to be my real estate agent. And I'm just picking that as an extreme example. It can also be, you know, you're doing the videos, do them with a drone. I hear a kid that uses a drone to shoot the video. And I was like, oh yeah, I use drones. I use drone tour. Do a drone tour of the place. But sometimes companies pick the item that is innovative to make it a status point. And whether you use a drone to shoot the video or not, it doesn't really make a huge deal. But suddenly you have this marketable point. And you're talking about the measuring stick of brand. Maybe it doesn't change the sale price of the home. But when I'm researching that realtor, that changes the perception of a client like you who sees me doing that. And that's a point of measuring stick of differentiation. So we have to we have to constantly do things in our industry that result in sales, but we also have to find a way to have a unique experience so that when uh, 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 someone gets online to research who they want to hire, there's a reason why you call. So that's a big deal to me. It's, well. it's got to be true in other industries, this herd mentality, right? Where, you know, I'll do it once everybody else is doing it instead of I'll do it first. Because doing it first is scary, right? And it could mean that it fails. And it could mean that it's not productive. And it could mean that there's no ROI. But ultimately, it could mean it's a home run, and then everybody wants to be like you. So you've got to see that in other industries, too, where people are like, yeah, I'll just sit back and wait and see. Like, there's still people out there right now that think Twitter's a fad, and they're going to wait until it, maybe it dies, maybe it'll catch on. Yeah, so I mean, I, well, if I give my, my example in Trend Hunter, we're doing cutting-edge trend research, but we just did our own conference. We called it Future Festival. We did actually give everyone a virtual reality headset and a drone. And it's like they go to this consumer research conference, they go to another one, but ours is the one where they got a VR headset and a drum. And they don't need that for their research, but then they go back to their offices and they're sort of like, yeah, no big deal, the future press, I this is my drum. And we get tweets that are like, this is the best day of my life. But they just want to have fun with whatever it is they're doing. And it's our weird little differentiator. The drone and the VR headset don't differentiate our research. But they established that no, nope, we're playing a completely um, different game. There's a poster I once had in my room with like, you know, the, the GM, the Hummer. It was like it was cool before people realized the world was dying. Anyway, <laughs> so rebrand this in your head to be a different company. But what was funny is it said it's not a matter of um, everyone else trying to keep up. It's a matter of no one else being able to follow. And I always thought that's like a, a badass way of thinking what you're trying to do. We only have you for a couple more minutes because you get a flight. Um, you said something at lunch which is really important we always have to focus on the next block of consumers and that huge block of consumer is the millennial the largest generation we've ever seen uh, so put on your millennial sort of uh cap uh i won't ask you your age but i'm sure you're right in there um and, and say as a consumer what does that knock my socks off agent look like for you when you do your research like for you if you were to be the consumer and put into what you wanted, what does an agent look like? So I think what is, we work in a lot of different industries, and with a millennial, it's a very different group, obviously, but the thing is, it's all technology-based. As a millennial, we've done a lot of work on millennial and finance, which has actually crossed over to some home ownership, so I'm just going to give you the generic. A millennial does not want you. They don't understand the purpose of you because you're in the middle. And in all other industries, they don't like the middle. They like crossing right to the very end, and using their Uber app or whatever to just get the data. They like MLS, they wish MLS was better. They don't know the value proposition yet. So if you're to differentiate, you would need to be tech enabled to show that you're speaking their language, but then you would also um, you know, need to think of the other services that you're providing, because there are other things. I'm about to buy a house, I need all sorts of stuff. I don't know how to figure out the next steps. And that's where I think there's other value that you add. Uh, the other little thing I'll leave, uh, there's a story I would like to say on the stage that I think is kind of cool when it comes to um, uh, an industry like yours where you're trying to think of how to differentiate. If you and I were getting into an ice cream business, the first thing we think about is what flavors do we want? And how many people like vanilla ice cream and have some right now? Do you have some vanilla ice cream if we add it? Yeah, okay. So if we were picking our ice cream flavors, one of them should be vanilla. But the weird thing is that if the market's bad or whatever, I don't care whose brand of vanilla I get. 
I could get Sherry's vanilla. I could get Melody's brand. I could get Jesse's brand. I don't care whose vanilla ice cream I get. But if I like Ben and Jerry's Sherry Garcia, that's the only flavor that I like. And when Ben and Jerry's launched, it was 1991. It was a global economic recession. Their ice cream was like four times more than everybody else's ice cream. But despite that, they quadrupled and they ended up selling for $330 million. Not bad. But the idea is that you're not trying to make that ice cream for everyone. There's a lot of real estate agents out there. You're trying to find out how to be irresistible to a specific group of people. And if we tie that into millennials, there's a certain type of thing that can make you my only acceptable agent. It's that you showed me some cool thing. It's that you said to me, hey, can we shoot your house with a drone? All right, that's the one I want. That's definitely the one I want. I didn't even know anything else about it, but that's it. He's got it. And literally for me, that is all that it would actually take. Shoot my house with a drone. And now you're, some of you are like, that's ridiculous. But like, what about me? Like, have this? I don't know. I don't care. I really just, I have no idea how to benchmark it. And I actually personally wonder, what else do you do? I don't know. But when you do something that speaks my language, I like it. So be irresistible to a specific group of people. Well, uh, uh, Jeremy, thanks so much. A round of applause uh, for uh, for Thank you. You gotta go take a flight. Um, how do people, uh, you know, uh, connect with you? Connect with uh, uh, trainer.com. Get sure. A so we've got that link that I sent out at the end, and it's trainer.com slash secret slash remax, and that has a whole bunch of our, our free research, first chapter of my book, my LinkedIn details. You connect with me there. All that wonderful stuff is there. I appreciate that. Appreciate it. Right, rock and roll. Thanks. Absolutely. All right, thanks everybody. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hug it out. Hug it out. Yeah. There you go. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Okay, up next, Wade Patterson. We did do. We usually do. We usually do. Um, Twitter. Twitter. One hundred and sixty bio is what we usually do, and. We are mindful of Jeremy's time, um, so he's now gone, but you can get him on Twitter at Jeremy Gucci, J-G-U-T-S-C-H-E, and his 160 Twitter bio, a bio read, CEO of Trend Hunter, at Trend Hunter, New York Times bestselling author, Bet Better and Faster, Exploiting Chaos in an Innovative Keynote Speaker. Uh, but that brings us to Wade Patterson, who's the Social Media and Communications Coordinator here with Remax of Western Canada. You can get him on Twitter at Patterson Wade, spelled the wrong way with one T. Opposed to the way my my, 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 my I'm, I'm married to a Patterson, the proper spelling. And uh, his 160 Twitter bio reads, I'm fairly effective communicator, irritated by the misuse of your and your. Not funny when I read it out, but when you read it, yeah, exactly. Oh, I also enjoy football and soccer, and or football, and then bracket soccer, and, uh, and volleyball. Thanks for coming it's on. It's one right. of those that doesn't really make sense. Uh, uh, check me out on Twitter. Now I don't, I, you know, this is probably completely faux pas, but because I've said it, I will do it. How many people are familiar with Wade Patterson and his role with us here at Remax of Western Canada? All right. I, I am beyond... Nice to meet you. Shake my hands and kiss my face. I am beyond thrilled, and I've been very vocal about what, what having someone like Wade Patterson means for agents in Western Canada. Um, and, and so on that note, I'll just let you jump right in. Tell us what your role is and, uh, and, and a little bit of history uh, in the real estate space with us because it's been about, about a year or so now. Yeah, absolutely. So I joined uh, Remax Western Canada in August 2014. Prior to that, I was a newspaper journalist in Kelowna. I did that for about three years. But the newspaper journalism industry is not exactly going this way. So I kind of... Trend cover. <laughs> exactly. Will tell you it's exactly. And so I uh, joined Remax and it's been really great. Uh, the communication side of my job, we work with Remax Ontario on putting out market reports, that type of thing. Anytime we release a press release, that's kind of coming from our department. And then social media, yes, I kind of manage our accounts, but that's a very small part of my job. A lot of people are like, oh, you're on Facebook all day. It's like, well, a bit of the day, but uh, a big part of it's the training. So we put on webinars about once a month that are on different social media topics. Uh, every couple months we'll have a sales associate orientation, just talking to all our new agents and just really trying to help people because I think with Remax, there's some who are very new to it and it's intimidating and they want to know how to set up a Facebook business page, but maybe they're a little embarrassed. Uh, whereas there's others who are like, what's the newest thing? You know, I've heard about this thing called Periscope. How does that work? Uh, so there's quite a range. So my job is to hopefully help um, 
no matter where you are on that scale. And and we've had a, a, a couple of chances to chat, and I find your history in in, the, in journalism fascinating because you definitely brought that approach to the way you use social, and I, I think social is just a new way of getting great content in the hands of people and then sticking around to have the conversation afterwards, which is even better than the newspaper. So so what have you found? What what skill sets have you brought from from the journalism industry that has, that has benefited you in social that we can always we all of us can take away and maybe approach it a little bit differently? Yeah, so one of the big things is in journalism, you're always trying to grab people's attention. Uh, so that might be with a clever headline or the first sentence, something like that. And I think when we're posting to social media, uh, interesting content, of course, um, we want to do that, right? We want to catch people's attention. Uh, so that first line of content and make it quite conversational. Those were the best news stories we'd ever have. It's when you get the comments underneath and you know people are really talking about what you're saying. And I think in social media as well, that's kind of the best social media content we can be putting out. And then also, uh, picture says a thousand words, right? Uh, a lot of people posting on social media, maybe leaving out the photo or leaving out the video, that type of thing. Um, so with journalism, you know, we'd always try to take great photos. Apps like Instagram really help us with that. Uh, so just trying to make our content as interesting as possible. And, and you both will sort of come from that same sort of world. And and uh, um, what 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 are the struggles, Valerie, that you still see us as an industry facing? And what I think is for the public a very maturing attitude towards social media. I think we were always all kind of brand new and crazy and we were permitted to make mistakes and not do it really well early on, 2009 through 12. But now I think, especially hearing from someone like Jeremy, I don't think we're permitted to make the same sort of early adoption faux pas that we, that we, we can't get away with in 2015. Yeah, I, mean, I think you're still permitted to make mistakes, but I think that it, it's, it takes a lot longer to recover from them now because people and immediately can see that you're making a mistake, that you're using, I mean, it, it, it's still hard to say you're using social media wrong because people are like, I can use it however I want, and that's true, but if you want to be effective, there's a right way and a wrong way to use social media in your business, and I think one of the challenges that we still have is that a lot of people are using it to push information out, and uh, that's a very kind of old-fashioned way of looking at media. Uh, when I started in real estate, more than a decade and a half ago, the whole point in your, your messaging was to put stuff in the paper, put stuff in the yellow pages, put stuff on a billboard, put stuff in a sign. And it was always pushing content one direction. But social media has changed our relationship with our customer in that they expect to not only get information from us, they expect to be able to talk back to us. And then, of course, they're all talking to each other. And so it's this big convoluted arrows everywhere now if you were to diagram it, whereas before it used to be very one directional. And I think a lot of the time we are using social media wrong by pushing content one direction and that's it. We post our listings, we tweet our listings, we say come to my open house and then we post it and we go away and we never come back. Instead of saying, you know, this is a conversation. We should be using social media to listen as much as we talk. You know, the old your mother said you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. It's the same on social media. You should be having conversations and you should be there for the conversations instead of just pushing information out. And I think that's a big challenge. And I think you'd agree that people go, well, I know how to post. I know how to, you know, but the, the rest of it is what's is not happening. So it's like going to a cocktail party and being like, hey, I'm Val and walking away. Okay. I mean, we do that on social all the time. And I think that's a, still a big challenge. Yeah, very true. And just to touch on the whole listings thing, I mean, um, you know, I see a lot of agents doing that, just pushing listings, listings, listings. The thing is, is that the people who are connected with you, at that moment that maybe they're buying a house, sure, those listings are super relevant to them. Um, but in the time afterwards, they bought a house, now they're happy where they are. It might be years till they're in that frame of mind again where they want to think about the next listing. And if that's all you're doing, if that's the only content you're putting on social media, if I'm that person who just bought the house, I don't really have a reason to stay connected to you. Um, so it's just another thing to think about. Well, I, I think that's true. I mean, I think advertising around new cars are really, really important to you up until the moment you purchase a new car and then you don't really want to see the content anymore. And I really think that that's why um, there's a lot of value in, in, in creating community content uh, and, and, and really being emotional, connecting to the consumer during the time that they own a piece of property in a certain community. 
one of the great things about having you Wade, in, in Western Canada is there's an example that a lot of people, a lot of agents can look to for content. You know, we get really, really busy. There's a lot of great content that Western Canada puts out that they can share and supplement into what they're doing. I don't think anyone should be just taking what you're doing and putting it out every day, but it's nice to have someone that we can look to as an example within our industry. And, and, and Western Canada's done a great job uh, in last year or so of, of, of really starting to create a great brand with great content. And so, Talk about that to be looking to you guys and so sort of the content you're putting out that will help all these agents uh, constantly be inside the conversations that are so important to have. And, and tell us too, like where do you find content? Where what inspires you? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the Remax of Western Canada page. If you haven't already liked our Facebook page, you just search in Facebook Remax of Western Canada. Like that because Remax of Western Canada is similar with Remax Ontario. We use the, those pages really agent focused, so they are. We're trying to use them as kind of examples of things you can post, and we'll post articles on there. Might be something that's interesting to a home buyer, something like that, um, that you can take and you can share to your networks. Um, but just speaking in terms of the examples, um, we've heard a lot about video and how important that is, and I was adding to that conversation and telling everyone how important video is. But then I realized, like, I'm not doing any video, so I. Challenge myself. We send out an email every two weeks to all our Remax Western Canada agents, and I was like, "Hey, I gotta start doing a video email." And I was nervous about it at first, and I was like, "Oh, this is gonna be terrible." And we still have a lot of things we can do to make those videos better. But I think like that's one example of you know if we can do it, uh, just kind of scramble to put a video together. I'm sure all of you can do it. Some of you are doing it very, very well already. But have you seen the results? The 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 interaction because I love them. I I would rather watch a video of you explaining than read the the, the, the the text. So what what results have you seen since you sort of shifted towards video? Yeah, so it, it's been positive. We track our open rates on emails, and the ones with videos do have a slightly higher open rate, which is good. But also, it's kind of funny. Um, some of the videos I do just myself. And then some will have someone else from our office, perhaps Marie, someone else. And the ones with the female members with me have a significant higher viewer rate on YouTube. Uh, don't worry, I don't take any offense to that, but uh, just something I noticed in the stats. So, so that's why teams will continue to win. Uh, uh, you've got a keynote now. It's going to be very interesting. You, you go here at 3 o'clock, and you're, do, you're doing a life, uh, a day in the life of a real estate agent. So just give people who might want to dive a little bit more into social media what you were talking about next. For sure, for sure. So I think one thing that's important before we start posting on social media is being honest with ourselves why people are going to social media. We have the mindset that people are logging onto Facebook to check out our listings. It's a little bit narcissistic and it's not true, right? That's not why we turn to social media. So once we understand that and get honest about that, um, then we can start saying, okay, this is why people are on it in the first place. How can I contribute to that conversation? So that's a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. What was the other question? I think that was it. Okay, perfect. That was it. I appreciate it. Can I make one really quick plug? Sure. Absolutely. Cool, cool. So there's this thing we're oh. doing. Yeah. Oh, I'll, that's that, that's that's my bad. That's my bad. I, you know, and, and it's been, who has taken the uh, Memories for Miracles Facebook challenge in the room? A bunch of us. Um, so if you know what that is, if you've been asked to post a child, uh, uh, post a child photo on Facebook, it's really exciting. Wait, do tell us about that before we have uh, Brenda and Elvin join us. So very quickly, this is kind of a social media challenge that we rolled out at Remax Western Canada. It's super simple for those of you on Facebook. If it comes to you, you'll get tagged in a post. Someone's posted a childhood photo and they're challenging you to do the same. Make a donation to Children's Miracle Network. It doesn't have to be large. It can be anything. The big purpose is we want to get some momentum behind this and really start to flow it uh, through Facebook. And Remax, you're also passionate about Children's Miracle Network. And it's fun, let's face it. So people are posting childhood photos. You dig through the old photo album, you find a funny one of yourself, upload it, it takes minutes. If people could do the ALS Facebook challenge videotaping themselves with that, I think we can do this. And let's keep the challenges rolling. If you've been challenged, take a few minutes and uh, keep it going. And just give us an update about how much uh, the challenge has already raised for the Children's Miracle Network. Right, so we unveiled it about two weeks ago and we're at about 6,500 for Children's Miracle Network. So let's keep it going. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate you coming on. Oh, I'll hug it up. You're, hugging. Uh, you're, you're on notice, Elton. I'm getting hugged too. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Mike. So now we're going to have our Canadian State of the Union uh, with uh, Executive Vice President and Regional Director of Remax of Ontario Atlantic, Greater Sandu, and Regional Executive Vice President of Remax of Western Canada, Elton Ash. Thank you.
throughout North America, we get a lot of people watching Remax agents and people from other brands. We're going to talk about the state of the uh, Canadian real estate market for a brief little bit, and then we're going to get talking about brand and culture and all that sort of stuff. So stay tuned. Um, we prepared some very tough questions. We've got very tough questions. So um, one of the things uh, I'd like to look at, and even even Jen was talking about how things are similar, you know, go around and around. What patterns are we going to see? Are we seeing right now that 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 was, are going to impact the Canadian real estate market 12, 18 months out? What what are we seeing right now as far as some some trends and patterns that are happening? Well, what we're what we're seeing right now, in, in, just in the industry overall, uh, it's a Toronto and Vancouver uh, difference. Uh, we're seeing the market being on fire in Toronto and Van both Vancouver and parts of of BC, but the rest of the country is really gone into balanced market territory. Uh, you know, there aren't multiple offers outside of uh, those two regions. And, and, and you throw Alberta into it, which is really, you know, starting to soften and there's a lot of concern with that market. So we're, it's really returning to a regional market now. It is. And, and you know, for me, myself, I mean, I, I, aside from Alberta, I'm hopeful that the long-term prognosis is going to be a, a stable one. But around the rest of the country, Going back to a balanced market is great. You know, in Toronto and in, in like I think in Vancouver, we're, we're seeing buyer fatigue, right? Buyers are going out there looking at houses, putting in offers, and offer after offer after offer, and then they step away, which isn't good for our industry, right? What we need is a return to a more balanced market across the country, which is uh, which is I think what's going to happen moving forward. And of course, the other thing that we see what happened during elections is right away people are, are unsure what the future holds for them. Is it going to be another conservative, liberal, an NDP government? You know, people are just, and so there's that back and way. So there's going to be, I think, a remarkable change after next week, once the election's held and people then know, well, this is the course of our country until the next election, and, and really doesn't change anything. But people just get that confidence to start moving again forward. So. And if we can shift from the industry and into what, uh, what are in our industry with regards to what's happening with realtors and with brokers? You know what I'm seeing, and, and uh, it is a return to basics, right? A return to basic skills development. And, and yes, technology is it, technology is no longer about what's new, and, and, and it's not always about the shiny object. In fact, technology now is infused into our our our, uh, our business, right? So when I when we talk about Facebook, it isn't about posting listings, as I was saying. It's about prospecting using Facebook. So we're going back to the basics, and the basics in our industry is about prospecting, right? If you're not prospecting, you're not growing your business. And and you know a lot of people when I when I talk to them and they say, well, does it have to be about growing your business? But absolutely, it does, right? It, the, the industry is growing at about ten to twenty percent a year, and if you're staying the same, you're actually dropping. So you need to continue to grow your business, grow your business from from new business all the time. We have to focus on that as an industry. So I'm glad you brought up growth because we have a lot of questions around that particular topic. And in particular, when talking about integrated technology and growth, one of the questions that we have is how how is OA and Western Canada as a brand looking to develop ways to help grow their agents? So how is the brand prepared to, I mean, listen to Jeremy this morning and again right now, things are changing. You know, change is the norm. The next generations coming up are going to have completely different expectations. What are the brand brands doing to help their agents prepare for those kind of changes? Well, that's a great question. And being two different regions, we end up having, I think, two different methods that we're following. Because I'm corporately owned region out of Denver, and of course, OA is part of the Integra group of regions. And so we end up approaching things slightly differently, but I think with the same conclusion at the end and for us it's been momentum for us with the corporately owned regions we've really taken the david scott program that came out of texas teaching our broker owners to then take the next steps with the sales associates and so the whole momentum program is around vision belief and mission and taking that that information down to the realtor level 
And then we just introduced a new team module, which is just coming out, and we've got a team summit coming up in Las Vegas in early December. And so, certainly as a corporately owned region, we're moving strongly in that direction. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, at the end of the day, in our DNA, we're about home and top producer, and so you can't remain there without growth. And, and from us, I mean, even though we're doing it slightly differently, what it is about is helping, you know, getting into training in a big way. We were not a training organization. You know, years ago, it was like, go over there, get trained, and when you're real agent, come back. Right? It's not about that anymore. It's about helping our realtors plug into the latest technology, infuse that latest technology into the business, and, and, and offer the kinds of services and tools that are elevate the business. So we were talking about lead generation. Well, moving forward, lead generation is kind of a thing that we have to get into. It's kind of like a green speak. Now what I think we're moving into is how do you convert those leads? And somebody had asked a question, you know, let's get our leads struck somewhere else. Well, you know what, at the end of the day, that's our job is to is to convert those leads. How, how do we more effectively convert those leads? Let's not rely on the 2% conversion rate that exists in the industry. Let's, you know, convert five, six, seven percent, right? And let's learn from each other. You know, we're all gathered here today uh, to learn not only from people that are on stage, and Jeremy was fantastic, we got some great sessions, but but you're here to learn from each other. I mean, the best learning is gonna come from each one of you. You, you guys are at the street level. You guys are, are doing this day in, day out, and the stuff that you're learning, let's get together, let's congregate, and let's share, uh, share our wisdom that we're learning from each other and help grow each other's business. We're not competitors. We're all here to learn from each other, and I think the onus is not only on us up here, the onus is on all of you, so let's take mutual responsibility and take each other's business to the next level. Absolutely. You know, I, I've been in the industry long enough that the first chunk of my of my career, nothing changed, really. I mean, we could get very good at the belly-to-belly belly skills. And so all of us in this industry have seen that, you know, the pace is picking up at, like, at such an alarming rate. And I would imagine the same for you. I mean, what what you have to educate our, the agents and, and add the value to the agents in your region used to sort of not move as fast and you be caught up in that same technology cycle that we're in. And one of the one of the really amazing uh, reports came out of the British Columbia Real Estate Association. It's fantastic. It's talk about remaining visible. So for every one hundred potential consumers, thirty-three percent are going to go straight to do an online search. Of the remaining sixty-six percent, seventy-one percent of those people are going to do an online search after they get a recommendation from a friend or family member. So the question that being, 33% and 71% of 66% are researching you before they talk to you. And the question is, what are they looking for and what are they going to find when they look? You know, and the thing is, the industry looked at that three years ago at the Korea level. And of course, the masses that are out there that I alluded to this morning earlier are scared to death of reviews because they know they're not doing a good job. And so we as a brand have to grasp and run with that because that's going to be our strength. That's our competitive advantage is that we're providing a superior service to the consumer and they know that and that's, as Richard said earlier, that's what the brand stands for. We are not a discounter, whether it's a de 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 desk discount fee or a commission discount fee. We are a premium brand. We're the whole brand crew of real estate. And listening to Jeremy earlier today and just on stage with Ben and Jerry's, the ice cream. We don't have to discount our services. We have our value proposition. We're out there explaining it. And with the tools that we're providing and that are out there, there's just simply no reason that we can't continue to grasp these things and run with them and really make them work to our benefit. I'm a CA, Michael, and you lost me in the back. So uh, all kidding aside, I mean, at the end of the day, what we do know is that, that you know 100% of people that are searching real estate are going online to do some sort of search at some point in time. The, the trend the, the trend that's kind of accelerating now is that people are going online more and more to find their realtor. It's still that majority of real the majority of realtors are found through word of mouth. That still is the case. But that's not going to be the case for too much longer. People are going online and finding you. So you need to make sure that you're online showcasing your expertise. When they go online, they're looking for for agent and the expertise. So if a first time home buyer goes online and sees you that you're you're operating in kind of for the masses and you operate all of Vancouver or all of Toronto, you're gonna lose that sale. If you operate in Joshua Creek in Oakville, Ontario, you know, and you're gonna have a better chance of, uh, of getting that, that client. And, 
And so, ironically, the smaller your trading area, the more money that you're going to make. And it's not about making money, but let's face it, this is a business here, and we're, we're in it for profitability. And, and, and you know, we all like the lifestyle of this business, and, and that's great. But at the end of the day, the, the wider your geography, you're, you're less likely to be known as an expert. You want to be known as, as an expert in a very specific area. And, and it's not about the, the data is readily acceptable, or sorry, readily accessible. What you need to do, what we need to do as an industry is showcase our expertise, build a reputation online. That's how you're going to be found by the new consumer. And it's a good conversation that I have with people that say, I've got a repeat referral business. Therefore, I don't need to have as a sophisticated presence online. The stats would say moving forward, even in a repeat referral business, you have to have that online as a verification of the recommendation of family member gave you. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, a good friend of uh, ours, uh, David Brown, has, has coined the phrase, I think he did, I'm going to give him credit for it anyway, it's a social audit, right? So people, even though they're your friends or family members, they still go online to make sure that you are the type of expert that you say you are. So it's even if you've got a repeat referral business, it's imperative that you're online or you're going to get left behind. Yeah, I, I had an opportunity to go down to Remax uh, headquarters in Denver uh, last week, and I saw saw Elton there, and I, and I took a bit of a tour, and uh, you can feel the, the the culture in the building. Everyone you talk to can sense the culture. So my question is, how does a big brand like Remax, from a region perspective, it, it, you know, help promote and foster culture at a brokerage level? Well, you know, that's a million dollar question because ultimately we're a pyramid. I mean, we have Remax LLC up top, then the regions, broker owners, sales associates, and consumers. And what has worked exceptionally well in the Remax organization has also been a weakness. The strength are the independent regions, independent brokers, and independent sales associates. It's like herding cats at times, right? That's the weakness at the same time. And so although we love our independence, we have to understand that we still work together and that we are truly a team in this together. And that as a team, and, and Dave Lineker explained this so well so many years ago, that the more signs that we have, the more sales associates that we have, the more signs that we have, the greater our market share and the more money everyone will make. And he stated that 40 years ago and it's still as true today as it was back then. And I think sometimes we get lost in that that fact that we're still a team and that we don't miss each other. Well, these are competitors in a professional way, of course, free his code of ethics, but nevertheless, when we're competing with another Remax realtor for that listing, which often happens in Calgary and Edmonton, where our market share is so strong, that it's respectful and we do differentiate ourselves individually, but nevertheless, we're still red, white, and blue. Good degree more. Uh, culture for me is one of the most important elements of, uh, of any business. And, and so you've asked a very profound question. How do we as this global entity, global organization, keep our culture? Well, you know what? I, I, I think it's actually relatively simple. At the end of the day, in our DNA, in each one of your DNA, you're part of an organization that's home of the top producer. And we've never lost that since the beginning. We're still home of the top producer. So everything that we do be it services, be it tool, that's meant to make you as productive as possible and increase your business and take it to the next level. And so, so and, and, and with the red, white, and blue, we are spending hundreds of millions of dollars every year to marry that promise of expertise, top producer. And what a top producer means is that you will get the best world-class service out there. So we spend that hundreds of millions of dollars to ensure that the red, white, and blue means that. And then at the ground level, with your hard work, dedication, and commitment to your craft, then you make it a reality. So, so it's a very simple message, and, and I think we're delivering it in spades, and, and we just gotta hold on to what our DNA is all about and not try to be all things to all people. We are experts in, in, in helping people buy and sell homes in, in niche markets and in, in very high local, local areas. That's how we're gonna keep our culture alive. And of course, where does this $100 million come from? It comes from you guys. You're the guys who are investing through the local GA funds, through the regional GA funds, and we're investing on your behalf. So it certainly is, and that's our message over and over again to a particular group of sales associates that really want to rebrand themselves separate from the brand. They're really hurting themselves more than anyone else. 
And that, again, together, it, it is your money that we're investing on your behalf, and we've been doing it very successful. It was, it was interesting. I, I was interviewing uh, a, a regional owner out in Germany uh, and, and talking about how different market that is. And one of their advantages over there, because they don't have an MLS system, they have an internal MLS system, that all Remax agents looking the same and sharing their, 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 their information is what their, uh, what their advantage is. And they know at some point, because it's small, it's an advantage, so eventually they'll get too big, or big enough, like we are, that then it starts to be, how do I step away and still leverage the big brand? And, and it, it is at the beginning, which I think 40 years ago, it was easier to keep for, you know, hurting the cats, the brand. But, you know, as someone's been with the company now for four years, every month that goes by, I see more and more value of, of, of being, you know, that Remax first, you know, sort of thing. It, it, the impact on our business has been phenomenal. Um, and, and it is this, Dance between the Remax brand and the personal brand, and uh, and, and it's difficult. It, it's that much more important in, in, in Canada. We, we, what we have is we have the country that everybody wants to move to. Is that not right? Yeah. And so <laughs> when that happens, I mean, just like when you go overseas or you go to, to a city that you don't live in and you're visiting, I look for Starbucks everywhere I go. I look for that green emblem, green and white emblem everywhere I go. And so when when these 280,000 immigrants, when they come to Canada, they're coming to Canada with money right now, right? And so they're looking for that red, white, and blue. And so if you're not part of that red, white, and blue, you're missing out on a, on a new stream of business for you. And so it starts with one deal, but most of you have been in the industry enough, long enough to know that one deal is never one deal, right? One deal over your career could spawn into 20, 30, 40, 50 deals. So, so if they recognize that you you are part of that promise of service excellence in real estate, then you're gonna you're gonna improve your business hands down. So we talk a lot about brand value. We think that's really important, and all of us agree that there's a lot of brand value for us. How do we articulate that brand value to a consumer in a 2015 or a 2020 world where they're more tech savvy, they're more seeing the process of buy it now, cut out the middleman, you know, as Jeremy's saying, you know, cut cut right to that buying process. How do we start to articulate our brand value differently to that next generation of people who are being programmed to think that way? Well, really, I mean, the whole thing is we're no longer, we all know this, we're no longer the gatekeeper of the information. What we are now are we're the facilitators, we're the counselors, we're the trusted advisor. Because the real estate transaction is not getting simpler. It's increasingly more regulated, especially as we look to the U.S. We've got FinTrack issues up here in Canada. I mean, that there's all kinds of regulation and, and, and home inspections, mortgage. I mean, there's all this stuff going on that for, especially a millennial, it's their first home purchase. It's the biggest investment they're going to make, whether it's, it's their first or this, their tenth. It's still a large transaction, and there is, it's a greater maze than it has ever been. And that is where it is so critical. For us to be the experts in our field and know how to guide them through that maze to the end result of enjoying their home. You know, I think uh, the onus is on us, and Jeremy talked about it in, in, in his speech, is that you got to communicate. You have to communicate with your target audience the way that they want to be communicated to. That's absolutely critical. Um, but part of that is is, is is letting them know what your expertise is. So yes, you know, data is readily available, but in actuality, there's too much data out there. So what our role, aside from being the trusted advisor, is to be the person that distills that data into wisdom, into knowledge. And, and, and so you need to showcase your expertise and then communicate that expertise to your audience the way that they want to be communicated to. And I think that's how you win in this, uh, in this new realm uh, of real estate. I mean, there's so often that I'll get a call from somebody or a text and, and they never ask me or I go into a store or a car dealership or wherever. The first question should be, well, how do you want to be communicated with? Is it text? Is it email? Is it the phone? I mean, the fax machine, whatever they are nowadays. But that's got to be one of your first questions. And, and I'll tell you a little story. I, I uh, just bought another uh, car. It's not the same car as I talked about last time I was here. But it's a different story. So I'm online looking at, it's actually a Harper, my wife, uh, uh, she was looking for the car and I was helping her. And so I've got a finite time, right? I got a one week window during Christmas break that I want to do it on an online searching, online searching, 
uh, for my car, or car breach car, I get to drive it once in a while. And as I'm searching, I'm putting my information in. I, I want to I wanna buy something. I want to buy it now. I've got a very specific need. I've got three kids. My, my wife and myself, there's five of us. We need two seats in the back. So I've got a very specific need, narrow timeline. And people are calling me as I'm still searching because I put in my phone number, right? That's great. They call me and they say, hello, Mr. Sandy. We see that you're looking for a car. Can we help you? And my answer is, no, thank you very much. And then I hang up. But long and short of this, I want to give the sale. But people are asking the same question over, how can I help you? I mean, that's not a question. The question is, what are your needs that I can fulfill for you today, right? And I would have said, I got three kids, I got a wife, I need a five, I need a seven seater because my kids fight in the back. And then, oh, and how long do you want it? How long do you have to make this decision? I got five days, right? And so it wasn't until I finally got somebody that started asking me questions. So it's not about, we all know that you need to contact, if you've got an online need, you need to contact that consumer within five minutes or you basically lost the deal. But that's not it anymore alone, because most of you already know that. In fact, all of you should. But what it is about is once you have them, how do you convert them, right? So if you don't contact them in the first five, 10, 20 minutes, you need to have an infrastructure in place, be it a team or what have you, or an administrator that contacts them right away. But then what do you say when you get them? And I, that's what's going to create. And that's where lead conversion comes in. Because the number one complaint you get on online leads, even from Lead Street, from Max.ca, are online leads suck. I hear it all the time. Online leads suck. I hate these. I, don't, I, would, I always get a phone number or an email, and if it's, even if it's right, I never hear back from them. But I think the number one problem is, is we reply to them saying, how can I help you? Not, hey, these are the three things you need to know about this house, and this is the one thing that we probably didn't put in the description that's probably most important and also it's available here or you know these are the special conditions on this property but we always kind of go into it with like what more do you need to know you saw the pictures uh you know so i think it's our, it's our response. find out what their needs are what their timelines are you know do they even qualify right don't waste your time either so it's 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 a new world as, I mean, you made a kind of a joke about the fax machine, and I remember when our office got a fax machine in 1995, and half the workforce lost their minds. But that leads me actually to uh, to our last question for you guys. Is, you know, technology has changed so dramatically in a very short period of time. It's affected the way homes are being built and whatnot. So, uh, on that note, uh, you guys are, are are in the business of of new brokerages, adding new brokerages, uh, opening up new offices. What what are we seeing in the trends and how offices look like and function compared to the traditional model? And what does the office of the future from real estate in 2025, what does it look like compared to what we've been so used to for a long period of time? I'll let Grinder go with this one first. <laughs> they sell more franchises than we do. They're still trying to catch up with us. You know, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, they're close to 10,000 agents, but we got 19.8% of the real population. There you go. So. We'll get there soon. Uh, let me know when you get to 10,000 though. <laughs> no, I, you know, it's, it's our business, it's, it's, no business is that. And so what we are, are, uh, are counseling our, our brokerages on it, and when we bring on new franchisees, we brought on two uh, great new franchisees this year, is that uh, location is one of the most critical pieces of the brokerage business. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, it was about individual office space, right? Uh, the statistics are uh, that it was about 250 square feet per realtor. Because realtors wanted to go to the office, they wanted to sit in an office, and, and in fact, it was great, we were talking about culture, it was a great way to build culture because the realtors were there, and people are the culture of an organization. Let's make no mistake about that. So there are some challenges uh, to the new office space scenario, but let me talk about the positives. The positives are is that is that there, there's more communal areas, uh, less individual large offices. So it's no longer 250 square feet per realtor, it's more like 50 square feet per realtor. So less individual office space, more communal space, so that we can congregate like we are congregating right now so people can learn from each other. There's a lot of a lot of millennials getting into our business that, that you know didn't necessarily grow up in the business. Uh, like many, I mean, I grew up in real estate business, so I was familiar with a lot of this stuff. Uh, before I got, uh, when I got into it, but but many many millennials, many young people are choosing this as a career from the get go, right out of university, and so they don't know what they're doing in our industry, right? So they need to be paired up with.
with mentors. They need to be paired up with people that have been in the industry uh, longer than they have. That's how we learn in this business. You learn from the wisdom and voice of experience. And so they're looking for communal areas that they can congregate in and, and, and learn from uh, people that are wiser than them. And, and so that's what we're seeing is we're seeing open areas where uh, it's kind of cafe style, uh, uh, cafe style tables with seating around the table so that people can open really right in the movable walls. Because again, millennials, and we talked about earlier, is education and training is so important and so critical for them. And so the office facility has got to be that it's got to be manageable so that you can make things move walls and bring in desks and, and make that central training area and then it becomes a social focus as well. Yeah. And, and, and so how does the office, because we you know we have a, a I would say a unique feel of an office, but how, how does the office go from being about the age of 250 square feet versus age of 50 square feet? How how are we making the office a place where the consumer also enjoys? I mean they're very different staples and apples stores both sell computers but have a very different environment do, do does the office of the future keep the consumer in mind when that would be absolutely in fact it's the consumer that's driving this i mean instead of the individual offices for the agents they're they're showpieces right the the uh, reception has to be a showpiece it should be something and I, it's because I, I i've been talking to all of many of you that you want to be proud to bring your buyers and your sellers into the office enter through a grand entrance and then take them to a private, this is a private matter, right? Take them to a private office, uh, like a closing room, so, and, and it has to be stand outish. It has to be a showpiece. It has to be something that realtors are proud to take people into. So it is with the consumer in mind, absolutely. And certainly things have evolved. I remember Phil Hagen from Portland, this was probably about 20 years ago, had, had this van and, and you could live in the van. You had the, uh, the fax machine there in the van, this communication system, and, and a little meeting room there as well. And you pull up in front of the house or the property or whatever, and, and things have moved from that. I mean, it's, it's interesting how this just continues to evolve. And, and ten, five years ago, it was all about virtual. You know, everyone could work out of their home. They didn't need an office. Well, that didn't work out so well because you still need the social network. And as hard as as broker owners try to provide it, the virtual, this truly virtual thing just didn't end up working. And they started going back to the office and building a facility that realtors could be proud of because ultimately it's a, sort of a subconscious psychological thing at the same time. Yeah, and, and, and there's also functionality, right? So the brokers who are leading the way are, are looking at some, some functions that agents can use. Because I mean, now that agents don't necessarily have large offices to go to, how do you drive agents to go there because that's what culture is based on. So so then green rooms, a lot of leading edge uh, brokers are putting green rooms in. I mean, video is huge, right? Bomb, bomb, I mean, look how, how pervasive it's become in our industry. So so brokers are setting up green rooms so that they can, so that realtors can come in and create their own videos inside of the office. And uh, so those are the kinds of things that, that many brokers are doing. I mean, some, some brokers are putting in little gyms so that realtors come to the office, go to the, you know, Go to the gym within the office and, and, and a shower there. So what brokers are not trying to do is how do we, now that there's, there's smaller, fewer offices, how do we drive realtors back into our office space? And so functionality that realtors use on a day-to-day -day basis um, goes a long way in, in doing that. Awesome. Awesome. And thank you so much uh, for spending about half an hour with us. That was the State of the Union, Canadian New York State of the Union. Uh, with Greater Sandu and, and, and Elton Ash. I uh, really, really appreciate the time, guys. Uh, phenomenal. My pleasure. Okay, so uh, if you haven't seen the show before, uh, I always end the show the exact same way uh, with a statement from Melanie Gallery, who has always been a huge, big fan of the show. And for the third time, we're doing the show live somewhere that Melanie could do her own sign now. So Melanie Gallier, the next work in Murray, you can come on up. And for those who haven't seen the show or, or, or know what we do, mobileetv.com. We've had 94 episodes now, phenomenal guests. Uh, Dave and I have an opportunity just to sit on the front lines and, and, and pick the brains of really smart people. It's definitely not about myself and Dave, it's about having great guests come on and, and ask awesome questions. Before I close out, do you want to remind them where we are the next couple? Episode. Yes, Tuesday, at, like in the afternoon, Easter time, yeah, ten thirty. We'll be broadcasting from uh, the Remax Tech event, our Tech Rally, 
in New Jersey. And then I think the following week we'll be on at a regular time because we'll, our regular time is 10 o'clock Pacific, 1 o'clock Eastern on Friday because it'll be the evening in Berlin. And we'll do a little round table wrap up from uh, from Berlin. But I'm excited to see Dave. If you're watching, go Mets, and uh, I'll see you next week. So, uh, on that note, over to you, Melanie. So, the way I like to end every single episode, to me, Mobile Agent TV has been so instrumental in me growing my business and staying ahead and being on top of, not on top of, like I just said, ahead of what's going on in the real estate industry. And uh, so tell five other realtors about this incredible show because Michael and Dave do this really of their time and uh, they're providing a really, really phenomenal service. So thank you, Michael. Thanks, Valerie. And of course, Dave, miss you. And uh, see you on the next show. Thank you, everyone. Have a great conference.